how can we build thinking classrooms to create memorable math moments? In this special episode, we share an opening session of the 2022 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit with you. Awesome stuff. Join John, myself, and our wonderful special guest, Peter Lildehall, as we unpack how elements of a thinking classroom are entwined in the Make Math Moments three-part framework. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are from MakeMathMoments.com. This is the only podcast that coaches you through a six-step plan to grow your mathematics program, whether at the classroom level or at the district level. And uh, we do that by helping you cultivate and foster your mathematics program like a strong, healthy, and balanced tree. If you master the six parts of an effective mathematics program, the impact of your math program will grow and reach far and wide. Each week here, you'll uh, you'll get the insight you need to stop feeling overwhelmed, gain back your confidence, and uh, get back to enjoying the planning and facilitating of your mathematics program for the students uh, or the educators you serve. All right, my friends, keep your ears open mm. during today's episode because while we'll be exploring all six parts of our metaphorical tree, we're going to focus in on the branches of the tree that represent mm. an effective mathematics program. Uh, that means our pedagogical content knowledge, looking at the teacher moves and how we actually facilitate mathematics with our students. Yeah, so the this this is the 2022 virtual summit opening session with Peter, and uh, we chatted all about the inter you know the intermingling of uh, Peter's work in his 14 elements of a thinking classroom and in the work that we're doing here with our frameworks, and uh, we talk a lot about the teacher moves that uh, that that you should be kind of thinking about as your your starting tasks, teaching through tasks. Task. We get Peter's take on that. Um, we get our take. I, um, I specifically remember us talking about um, using non-curricular tasks and curricular tasks and when we should use some of those and when we shouldn't use some of those. So stick around here and let's dive into the branches. All right, here we go. Right. Awesome to see everyone. We have a, a special guest joining us tonight. Uh, you may have uh, you you may have seen this particular individual. He's coming to you from. The sky in Toronto, actually, no, in a hotel in Toronto. Uh, Peter, great to see you. How are you doing tonight uh, as we uh, get ready to kick off the fourth annual virtual summit? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's sort of ironic that I'm actually here in Ontario as we're doing this, and uh, we're probably sitting two hours apart from each other, which is we are. I don't think we've ever recorded anything together where we've been this close. So, <laughs> right. so Peter. Uh, we are here to chat with you about what actually matters in order to make some math moments and promote thinking. And, and maybe it's not even an and. It's like, mm. if you want to make math moments, you have to get kids thinking, I think, is more of the caveat right. there. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for everybody who decided to give up their Friday evening, and I know you're coming from all over the world, so Friday evening is probably only a, a local descriptor. Some of you are coming from yesterday, I think, uh, <laughs> and some of you are coming in from tomorrow. Um, that that so is wild. welcome, everybody. I, I, like I say always, I think this is a height of professionalism when teachers are willing to engage in this kind of professional learning outside of the confines of their contract. It just shows how, how dedicated we all are and how you all are to your profession. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk. So, yeah. you know, like I, I, I think that it's sort of ironic that we're call that you had that heading, make math moments and or thinking as if they're mutually exclusive events. But I mm -hmm. think, I think you and I have always we've been on the same journey for a long time, mm -hmm. right? We've been trying to find ways to engage students to captivate their interest, to capture that curiosity, to vector that curiosity towards something that is productive um, and satisfying and rewarding for the students and uh, so that they can start to learn, think, attain, and start to feel like they're, that they are capable of doing mathematics. Yeah. So I think, you know, we just have, we come at it from different angles, but I think we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Peter, I'm, I'm, 
uh, why don't we start here? Like when when we work with 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 districts and we work with teachers and and what we primarily start with is when we help we help these people along the a, a pathway of learning to change some of what's happening in their classrooms often we start with like what type of lesson do we pick like how do we pick a task to use with our with our classroom like you saw everyone here say yes they know about building yeah. thinking classrooms mm -hmm. they probably know about make math moments they're here with us they kind of know that the tasks are there or or you know we they know about elements of how to build a thinking classroom um, but a, a lot of questions we still get, a lot of questions I think you probably still get is, is like, how do you pick that first task to start with or a task to, in your classroom? Like, what is it, um, like, what do you look for when you think about a good task to use in your classroom? And like, what motivates you to kind of like pick that task? Okay. So, okay. First of all, so when I work with a school district, I work in different capacities. So in one capacity, I'm going into a session, maybe I'm working with teachers that day. Maybe that's what I'm doing. And I want them to live and breathe and feel a thinking classroom. So I'm picking a task for them. Mm -hmm. right? And this is, sometimes I actually I have to say explicitly, do not use this task with right. your students. Mm -hmm. This is a task I picked for you as learners to experience a thinking classroom. Like I'm not gonna come into a professional development session with a really exciting long division question like that's I got to come in with something that is clearly outside of the curriculum but also hits them as a learner much more right. so than as a teacher is 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 that is that because you're like you want to get away from them kind of like steering their math learning at that point and getting them to experience something that they they don't know at that point like our students when we do a math task with them right at the beginning they don't know exactly what math is going to happen that day or they might not even you know we're trying to develop and connect some math concepts that day so we're not expecting them to know the math when we start with a task is that why you're picking like a task yeah. that for teachers it's like hey i'm going to use this task uh, because I, I know you don't know where we're going here. Yeah, I want my I want their first experience with me. And anybody who's in this room who has done a, a in person or even a virtual workshop with me knows that my I want your first experience with me to be as a learner. So you're gonna so I need to immerse you into that space. I need to give you something to think about, right? But it needs to, and because I'm giving you something to think about, it can't be something you already know about. Right. right. So this right. is why I try to get as far away from the curriculum as possible. But it also fits into that research that we found that we got to start with a non-curriculum task. Right. Like it's I want to capture curiosity without without that 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 forward seeking radar going beep, 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 beep. Where can I use this in my curriculum? Where does mm -hmm. this fit in? Is this mm -hmm. right? Like I just want mm -hmm. you to be a learner. Right. And I think that's the same thing we want with our students as well when we first start trying to expose them to a different way of being in the classroom is we want to shed those expectations that we're trying to hit an outcome or a standard that it's like, no, we're going to strip away what the sort of outcomes here. And we're just, we're just building an experience. And I want mm -hmm. you to just be present in the experience. I love it. I love it. And it's like, the, you know, the way we look at planning and I, and I, I see a, a very, very similar thinking process here is, you know, what is it that we want our audience to land on? Like, what are we hoping that they'll walk away with? And of course, as you had mentioned, for educators, what you want them to walk away from is probably very different than, say, what we're <laughs> after our students to walk away from. Yeah. I have a curriculum I need to teach, right? And that, you know, I want to make sure I hit this standard or that standard. But for educators, it's almost like you want them to experience what you want students to experience, that thinking, that, you know, the... The experience that, you know, John and I didn't give our students, you know, when we look at this gradual release of responsibility, um, you know, classroom, uh, I realized that my students actually didn't do a whole lot of thinking. And it was almost as if like, I told them exactly what we were going to do right up front. And it was like the cat was out of the bag, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, why, why don't we get started with that? Like in order to, you know, this quote, we were chatting the other night as we were preparing and uh, you brought up this John Dewey quote, which I thought was really mm. helpful for where we want to take the discussion now, which is around this idea of how do we get, like, how do we capture the attention? How do we capture uh, and engage 
our students. Now, the same is true for adults. Like right now, we're trying to capture the attention of everyone that's in this room. There's over 850 people who are joining us live right now. And we're trying to make sure that, you know, they want to look this way. And we need to do the same thing for our yeah. students. Um, I know for myself, I don't know if you fell into this, Peter, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. But for me, I used what I call attention gimmicks at first, right? Like I tried to sort of like, you know, mm -hmm. appeal to whatever the students are interested in, but it had nothing to do with what my goal was for the lesson that day. And then there was this massive gap in between. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've been there oh, yeah. or how you help teachers <laughs> overcome that. What, what are your thoughts it, on that? Well, it's all, it's like, okay, everybody look over here. Now let everyone get really interested over here, get really focused on this. This is really exciting. Now we're going to do this thing over here. It's yeah. like, and the, it was like, the rug, which yeah, is less the rug. exciting, right? Yeah. It, it's sort of like, I'm trying to entice you with a little bit of reward up front. And so that I can cap. And, and you're right. Like John Dewey has this beautiful quote about, we want to capture students' attention in the direction we want to hold it. Capturing students' attention isn't difficult. All we need is a wig and a rubber chicken. You got their attention. Yeah. Right. Like, but, but it's not in the direction you want to hold them. Right. Like if we're trying to get them engaging in patterning or um, looking for constructing number or constructing shape, or we want to get their attention on extrapolation, we got to capture their attention in that direction. And this is, you know, that's, it's not trivial, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I've come to reconcile with this is that the re the thinking classroom research really showed me that my goal is not exclusively to find engaging tasks. It's also to build engaged students. And I think we're 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 alike in this regard, mm -hmm. which is that, yeah, to kickstart the process, the task needs to really hold all the attention, right? Like it's got to be where all the engagement is. And it's got to hold that attention in the direction we want to hold uh, hold the, the students. But as we get better at this, we still want to use good tasks, but the students are now, they're walking alongside us, right? They have some a priori engagement as they come into the activity. But getting back to your first question, which is, okay, so I'm going into a classroom and what am I going to pick as a task? Well, I often start with a conversation with a teacher about, there's always two questions. One, where are you in your building thinking classroom journey? Because if you haven't gotten off the mark, guess what? We're doing non-curriculum. But if you are off the, off the mark, now what is it that you're teaching? What is it that you're trying to get to? Okay, you want to do linear relations? Let's go in that direction. You want to do Pythagoras? Let's go in that direction, right? You want to factor quadratics, complete the square, whatever it is, let's go in that direction. Um, and then we start trying to think about how do we pick a task? Mm -hmm. um, and I always keep a couple of things in mind when I want, when I, when I'm trying to bring curriculum into the classroom, when I'm trying to do a task that's curriculum focused. One is what's my first question? Like, wh what is the context, the setting, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the problematic situation in which I want to engage them in? So sometimes it's, Something as mundane as let me show you a really cool relationship in a right angle triangle. But sometimes it's, what do you notice if I do this? And, and right, so what, if, what do you notice if I take a ream of paper and drop it on a desk? Mm. And I take another one, I drop it on a desk and I drop another one. What do you notice? Now I've got their attention, but then the next question is where do we go with that? Mm -hmm. and, and now we're talking about what is my goal what is the outcomes I want to hit? What am, where am I willing to zig and zag? But what is always on the forefront of my mind is, what am I going to ask them second? And what am I going to ask them third? Mm -hmm. And what am I going to ask them fourth? Because I can't, one of the hard and fast rules in a thinking classroom is nobody ever gets to be done. Hmm. Right? right? So I always have to think about, it's not just like we used to do in the old days. Hey, we're going to hear here's the activity, here's the worksheet that you're going to fill in, it's already drawn the table of values for you to fill in, and the graph is there for you to graph it, and then the four questions I want you to answer. No, right. it's this sort of slow reveal. Right, right. You know, right. Peter, I feel like you were like looking in some of my old planning materials when uh, <laughs> you were talking about that, because that's, you know, that's exactly 
what we would do. And I brought this quote up. I'm sort of, for those who are giving context to everyone who's joining us, I've got a massive slide deck with all kinds of ideas that may or may not come up in this conversation. Uh, but this quote sort of, you know, jumped into my mind. We use it a lot when we're sharing and presenting with educators, you know, that, you know, we often do a lot of these things ahead of time. And, you know, what John and I have realized over time is that actually, if, if we actually stop pre-teaching everything, and actually allow students to do some of the thinking, if we actually allow them to engage in a task first, then we can actually keep their attention much longer. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, planning with that intentionality, as you mentioned, I think is is really important. And, mm -hmm. you know, something for us, I know, John, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. And mm -hmm. I know, Peter, for you, it's it's much the same is that we have to be thinking about what do students actually know what is it that we want them to now know and how high can that ceiling be? And as you mentioned, Peter, it's almost like it's a limitless ceiling. We need to be thinking far enough down the road that, you know, students aren't just standing there saying like, okay, now what, or I'll just go sit down and wait for the rest of the group. You know, we sort of have to have this like nice long runway of ideas here. Uh, yeah. John, like, what are mm -hmm. you thinking about when you're uh, planning mm -hmm. your tasks and yeah. trying to figure out which one we need to select to try to engage students, but then also get them to that thinking piece that we want? Totally, totally. And I think I think we're along the lines here with Peter, where Peter is like thinking like, well, from what I'm hearing is in what I've what I've experienced when when, you know, viewing your live sessions and being in your live your live presentations is 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 thinking about those those questions and I love that you're like thinking about all those questions down the line to kind of because you know exactly where you're going to go so that intentionality is key and I think when we start to create our tasks in in our classrooms and in, in the tasks that we have up over on the on our websites we start with like that that kind of like a fundamental kind of idea on context we'll take a context and we'll think what is a what is like a a truth i can reveal from this context that that can kind of keep us going down that line so a lot of times we try to pick a task you know and we might go to the textbook we might go and, and find a you know a, a common task that mm -hmm. that uh you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna tackle but what we like to do is we like to put in what we call the curiosity path so we we strip away a lot of information. And, and this is kind of like, P Peter, you're kind of like saying the same thing when you said like, you're thinking about those four questions or five questions down the line, and it's a slow reveal. Yeah. We we use that in our curiosity path. Like in the, on the screen here, we're looking at like this common, common problem that's from the textbook. But what we like to do is strip as much from that away as we can so that we can do the slow reveal. So it's kind of like, let's pull all that back. Let's yeah. see if we can spark a little bit of curiosity here, because we know that if our kids are leaning in for curiosity, then we can take that attention we're getting and steer them in the right way. Uh, and, and then we have them focused in that, that right direction, like that quote that we had up on the screen earlier. So, so the curiosity path, we, we kind of just, you know, toss the name on that, but it starts with withholding as much information as you can. Like if you think you pulled a couple questions back, like you, you know, gave them a and B, and then you're like, you know what, I'll hold C and D for later. You probably mm -hmm. still didn't strip enough away. It's like, we got to go right back to the beginning and going like, there, let's start with nothing. And let's see if I add something in here that can change, you know, give them a little bit of a nugget to get started. And then we'll keep giving them nuggets because that will create anticipation. And that anticipation is what kids are going to be like, I want to know more because if if we can just start a problem by showing them, showing them some piece and then asking them to say, well, what, you know, what, what do you notice? What do you wonder here? Um, let's get to an estimation and then go, okay, if I wanted to take this estimation and make it more accurate, what do I need? Because that that part for us is like our game changer question. Because if students are starting to tell us what they need to make that estimate more accurate, they're already on this thinking pathway, right? They're already thinking about strategies. They're already thinking about what they're going to do with that the numbers. And hey, and they might even be going down a pathway that we didn't anticipate. That's okay. We can say, you know what? Okay, you wanted this, this, and this. You wanted to know the height of this paper stack. Okay, maybe you wanted a 10 stacks. Well, I don't have 10 stacks. I have six packs of paper for you only. And I'll, I'll help you with the height here. So we like to like take that information and give them what, what, they, what, they, what we've got in mind. But listening to what they have in mind is like the problem solving practice and and then think how much information you get as a teacher 
to know where that student is by just listening to their strategies. So let me, so you have this nice visual here. Let me, let me tell a story about when I use this, a derivative of this task hmm. with a group of grade eights. So that was a, that was a math, uh, you know, threw in a little math term there too. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm in a grade eight classroom and I'm working with a teacher and she wants to do linear relations. And I thought, Hey, why don't we do this three act math task? The, the paper stacking one from you. And, but you know, I deliver it a little bit differently. So it was, mm -hmm. the kids don't know me at all. They've never met me before, <laughs> but they know I'm coming in. So I gather the, I come in, uh, the teacher launches, and then I call everybody over to me. And we're standing around this table. And I'm standing sort of near the edge of the wall, of the room, and there's a counter behind me. And I reach behind me, and I grab one of these reams of paper, and I drop it onto the desk. And, you know, when you drop a ream of paper onto the desk, it makes a big bang, hmm. right? Now I got their attention, but not in the direction I want to hold it, but I got their attention. Right. And I grab another one, drop it, bang. And like, they are hyper-focused on what I'm doing now, because obviously something's going to happen here. I grab another one, bang. I grab another one, bang. And then all I do is I look up at the ceiling. I look down at the pile of paper. I look up at the ceiling. The kids are all looking up at the ceiling. And <laughs> What's up there? <laughs> and then it's like, and then I just said, I wonder how tall it would be if I have 50 of these. Hmm. And then I said, data's around the room go and we put them into groups and off they went and we had photographs of the paper stacks on the table spread out around the room mm. and uh on each photograph there was a height and um and so they had to run around the room and gather this information what these different data points so there was there was one for two high there was one for three high there was a five there was an eight and there was a ten Okay, and they had these data points. And um, those numbers were chosen very deliberately. Because one of the things I'm always thinking about is not just what is it, now I've sparked their curiosity. Now I've got them going in the direction I want. But where is the cognitive dissonance that I want to occur? Where is that that thing that's going to, when they think that they're, everything is going exactly as they're expecting, <laughs> that something's gonna happen. And the, the place I placed that in that one was, I have a data point for five and I have a data point for 10. And mm -hmm. I'm asking how tall 50 would be. What do you think students do? Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, one group grabs a five and says, we're just gonna multiply this by 10. There's right. our answer. They're I standing there with a big grin on their face. Yeah, we got it. Another group grabs a 10, multiplies by five. We're good, right? Then I put those two groups together and I say, how come you have different answers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because one of the things that I never said anything about was the table. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And now, now just to be clear here, Peter's describing um, the same task, but he, like he said, he delivered it differently. So this picture didn't match. Like you didn't give them this no. picture here on the screen. They had no idea that this was on a table. Like you were stacking them on the table right in front of them, but you didn't like clearly say, they're on a table, right? They, they, and you know, I didn't say that the measurements from the floor. Right. right. And so when the now the pictures, the data around around the room, uh, Peter, fill us in. Where was was the table in the picture? Yep. Yeah. And so then it was like I, I'm picturing the number, uh, the height is around like that many stacks, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, if there's three stacks, it says uh, ninety centimeters. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love I love and it. It's, and it's like. And the kids, they don't really bat an eye about that. They don't, they don't interrogate that data at first, right? So right. yeah. So what did your what did your students do? Because I, I'm imagining, imagining that flow is that is that students are multiplying and they're saying, well, how did you get different answers? What was like yeah. you've obviously done your four question, five question plan. You knew yeah. you knew they were gonna try to do this. That's an anticipation stage yeah. of you anticipating their their thinking in advance. And then what was your next question to them after you were like, there's like they're saying, Well, why do you have different answers? And then yeah. I, I'm imagining like there's this key move next for you. So then, then, well, the next one is, okay, whatever they've done, 
is if they've done something where they've made too hasty an assumption, it's, you know, you, you got to slide in there. And like my favorite move is to pair them with a group that has a different answer. Right, right, right. Right. Convince. Yeah. Convince each other. Who's right. Yeah. No, well, my move, my, my statement is always, huh, you have 140 meters and you have 32 meters. I can guarantee you that at least one of you is wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then they start talking um, because I've created that cognitive dissonance now. And then what happens is now they start interrogating the data a little bit closer and they're like, wait a minute. Two stacks of paper. There's no way that's 78 centimeters. Right. Right. How can right. two stacks of paper be 78 centimeters when three stacks is 81? Like, how is that possible? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so they start, they start interrogating the data. Once they start interrogating the data, we're off to the races. Now they're starting to look at calculating how thick one is, or some will calculate how thick two is, and then they'll extrapolate that upwards to 50, but then add on the original condition that right. they have. So we're off right. to the races. Now yep. they've created a table of values. The table may or may not be ordered. So here comes the next question. Nice table of values. Hmm. What do we normally do with tables of value? Right? And they're like, oh, we graph it. Now, grade eights would rather chew off their arm than draw a graph. Yeah, so right. it's like- <laughs> uh, Most adults do, to be honest. Let's, let's be honest here. But, but the questions I ask, you, you know, is also like, well, how high, high would it be for 100? How many stacks of paper would it be if the height, for to, how many stacks of paper do I need to get to a height of six meters? So now I'm flipping the question, which is not, you know, I'm, I'm, if we're thinking about graphs or tables of values, I'm flipping between the X and the Y here. And, and what's nice, you, you always pick a number that has, that it doesn't go perfect, that they have to, they get a decimal, they have to have a discussion about whether they round up or round down, right? And then we have this discussion. And then here comes the hard part. And I've made a modification to this. Walking around and trying to convince them so then I walk around and I hand them a ream of paper. I said, These, this ream is yellow. Now, I don't know if you know this, but yellow paper is thicker than white paper. <laughs> and like, it's, that's a hard sell. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Trying to convince them that this, this ream of paper is thicker. What's going to happen to your answers now? Cardstock, yeah. Right. So now what happens? Because now we've been pushing into, we may have been table of values, we may have, depending on what the outcome is, we may have pushed to a graph, we may have pushed mm -hmm. to an equation with a slope and a constant. We may, and, and this constant now takes on a real meaning. It's not just a y intercept, that constant is the height of the table. It's a real meaningful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I'm trying to convince them that yellow is thicker and blue is thinner. And I'm asking more conceptual questions like, so what happens to your graph or your line or your equation or your table of values or your answers if we're now doing it for right. yellow paper? Right. And, and this is why I've made a modification. I don't do reams of paper anymore. I do books. Mm. Uh, you can get different book sizes. I can get different book sizes. Right. So I can go up to a group and I just hand them a book and I say, what do you think will happen if, we, if the question was about this book? Mm-hmm. Good. You know, yeah. our consolidation prompt for that particular task is about books. So it's interesting. Uh, we've never had this discussion before, but yeah. our heads went in a very similar spot. You know, something I wanted to mention as you were describing that scenario was, again, like I'm hearing when you described, it's like we're using the same context. And I would argue that some of the same big ideas are being mm -hmm. revealed, but you are going for a certain part of that big idea. And uh, we tend to use that particular task to try to explicitly get students to calculate or, or to kind of bump into this idea of the initial value or the y-intercept. Now, mind you, same thing is causing your struggle, like causing the struggle for your learners, but you're trying to almost have them bump into this non-proportional relationship or this you know partial variation over direct variation. So again, like I wanted to bring this back up about this idea of planning with intention 
because it's exactly that. It's not uh, what task will engage my students today and sort mm -hmm. of keep everyone thinking just to keep them thinking. It's yeah, like it's not, we have it's not to, a set it and forget it. That's for exactly, sure. Exactly. Exactly. There has to be that intentionality at its core. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the more intentional we are about what we want to do, the easier it is, because then you know what not to do and what you do want to do. Like it, it allows you to say no to more things, right? So when I say yes to this thing, it means I'm saying no to something else. And if I if I can actually focus in on the things that I need to say yes to for today's lesson, I think it makes that decision-making process a whole lot easier. Um, this last piece I wanted to kind of articulate, which I'm hearing from, is this idea of emerging emerging strategies. Like you had already thought this through, like you, you pre-planned that students are likely going to bump into this idea. I saw someone in the chat saying like, no students knew it was the table. There may be some students that might have bumped into that idea, but the reality is, is that we often rush to tell kids these things before we give them the opportunity mm -hmm. to like think it through themselves. So it's not something yeah. they'll just immediately know because they don't have experience playing with the context. And then obviously the mathematics that are underpin that context as well. Yeah. And I wanted to add something here too about the the way that this was unfolded because I think I think some sometimes this whole set it and forget it thing can come into play like it creeps into our lessons you know you know it just it just shows up like and what I mean by by that is is a lot of the tasks that we share on on our website start with a video prompt and in that is done to capture some curiosity it's a, it's allowed us to strip away information and present it visually uh, that helps us kind of tell a story wraps it around some context mm -hmm. and what peter peter was doing this you know at at the tables just doing this at the tables like it doesn't have to be a video mm -hmm. context it doesn't have to be at the tables and i think i think a lot of the times teachers um they they misconstrue engagement or the the you know the 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 beauty of this task comes from this video, like this one you're watching here of Kyle and I eating some chocolate, or from the storytelling, or or like I think Peter, maybe maybe you can admit, admit to this as well. I think a lot of teachers grasp they they grasp building thinking classrooms and the work that you've been doing because they see their like one one element that we hear so much is that is the vertical non permanent services right it's like everyone's up the boards they're working and you and as a teacher who's had kids at their desks for years and you know mimicking what's happening at the board and as soon as we get them up working we're like we've got engagement we've got engagement and so i think that one move that one move thinks i'm doing a thinking classroom because i have students at the boards yeah. And I think that that part is like this, the same idea that Kyle and I are experiencing with teachers who are like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm making math moments that matter because I'm playing a video, you know, and mm -hmm. I, that's not, that's not, I don't think, and I, maybe, maybe you want to jump know, in on I this. Agree. It's, it's not, it's not the essence of what makes a big, a building thinking classrooms or a math moments, right? There's, yeah. it's the questioning and the, in the way that you handle that task that actually does it. And it's so, yeah. And by coming back to this. The planning. So there's planning with intentionality. Now, does that mean it always goes well? No, right. but we still have to be intentional. We have to try to anticipate what are the things that the students are going to do right? What are they going to do wrong? Where are they going to bump into things? And then can I cause them to bump into something? Now, I, right. in, there's this wonderful word, word out of complexity theory called occasioning, which is I can occasion something to happen. Does, that means it might happen. I can set the environment in so that the environment is ripe for this thing to happen. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, which means now I've done all the planning. Now it's going to, now it meets with first contact, right? The kids are now on the boards. They're thinking their curiosity is hooked, but now what, mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to run out real fast. Now mm -hmm. comes the on your feet dynamic. Okay. I have a plan. And now I have to somehow delicately see if I can help that plan come to fruition by asking the next question, by giving the next prompt, not synchronously, asynchronously. When a group is going this way, what can I say to them? Yeah, yeah. When a group is going this way, how can I enter that conversation and, and, and enter their conversation, not just say, okay, you're on to part B now and right. part B, you have to do this, but rather, okay, what is their particular A look like and how can I feed into that? And, and there's this delicate dance between trying to bring my vision to life 
and trying to avoid them sensing that I'm sheepdogging it too much is what I call it, where I'm trying, they start to feel like I'm, I'm starting to nudge them too much, that I'm, I want them to, to live in their own curiosity and their own engagement as we're working. And it doesn't always go well. And it sometimes right. it goes better than expected. Like I'll give you an example. We were doing, I was in a grade nine class. We were doing one of Alita Klassen's tasks about jobs. It was linear relations. And so this, here's, here's a job, right? So like she has all four jobs at once, but we didn't do that. We said, here's your first job. Your parents have said you can get a job. Um, here's your first job. And it's a graph. So make, put this graph up on the board and it's a job that starts in negative $60 <laughs> and it's a linear slope. Like it's a, it's a slope that goes up. I can't remember what it goes up by, let's say 20, $20 an hour, but it starts at negative $60 and the kids are like grade nines are going, what the heck kind of a job starts in negative $60. And now they're trying, like, we haven't said anything, but they're trying to figure out what kind of job starts at negative $60. <laughs> And we didn't anticipate they would have this conversation, but they had amazing ideas. Well, maybe you got to pay for gas to get to work, or maybe you got to buy a weed whacker because you're going to be mowing lawns, or maybe you have to buy some clothing or a uniform. Like they, they were amazing. And then, okay, so here comes your next job. And the next job was, um, was an equation. So they graphed this equation onto the same graph and it started at zero, thank goodness, but it had a lower slope. And now the kids are going, hmm. And we, we expected them to say, just sort of like, okay, well, this one starts higher. This one will be mm -hmm. better. Or they'll say this one's better eventually because it's steeper. No, every single group without us expecting it spent literally 20 minutes trying to figure out where these two lines intersected. Wow. And we hadn't asked them to do that. And it's mm -hmm. just like we had piqued a curiosity and this thing was going to run its course. And, and now we're in the thick of it. Now we have two choices. We can get them on to C. C is a table of values. You got to plot that one. Or we can let this run. Right now they're going in a direction we hadn't expected. And they're going in a direction that in the end might not actually make a difference when they get to part E. But they're curious. Mm -hmm. They're thinking. They're engaged. They're chasing their own passion and they're doing a ton of math, right? Totally, right. Totally. So we, so yeah. this is, you know, as much as we plan, we also have to learn to be responsive and responsive to where they are in their conversation, right. not where we are in our conversation. Yeah. And right. I, I, lo I love the idea as well that, you know, there are going to be, and I think it's really important for everyone to know that you could spend a ton of time pre-thinking and planning your lesson and sometimes it doesn't go anywhere near what you're expecting. But the thing that you should anticipate is what you're going to do regardless, which is we need to like tie those loose ends at the end. So, you know, I'm showing some sample student work here. And it's like, I want to be able to like look at the student work and try to think, how am I going to take some of those ideas and then weave them into the new learning from today. So if it is a new model, for example, like if it is, you know, let's say it's a double number line that you're trying to help students understand or see, it's like I could take some of that student work in order to help them see it maybe in a new way. Is it great if the students brought up, like some student came up with this solution? That would be perfect. That would be ideal. But we know that we don't live in an ideal world. We still have to get to that new learning. But the thing that we did do that I never did for a long time in my career is I actually let the students think. I got to actually, the best part is, like you were saying, Peter, like you're walking around listening to what students are saying. And I think that's part that oftentimes we miss out. It's like, okay, the kids are doing work, they're engaged, but you're learning so much about where students are, right? Like, are they on board with the context? Do they understand what's happening? Or are they, you know, complete, like, are they lost? If they're lost, that means that next prompt has to come where, okay, you know, I need to help redirect them a little bit to try to get them back on track. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't want to just sort of go, oh, it didn't work out. We mm -hmm. still need to kind of ensure that they took something new away from the experience, um, hopefully building on the work that they've done so far. Yeah. And they have, and that this is in, in my book in chapter nine, I talk about seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, this idea that, for example, I dropped that thing about, so what do we normally do 
with a table of values. Oh, we draw a graph. Mm -hmm. Maybe I really want this lesson to culminate in a graph or a graph that shows all the data and how we can extrapolate and that we can look at. Well, look, we just have to, if we want to understand what a hundred, how tall a hundred reams of paper is, we just have to go out on the x-axis to a hundred and look at what the y value is. Or if I say, how tall can, how many reams of paper is it going to take to fit to get to six meters, I can go to the six meter mark on the y-axis and go across. And I really want that to happen. So I, I, I may plant that idea. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, wow. And then it's like, but like I said, great hates to want to draw that graph. So I may have to circle back around and go like, so how's that graph going? Right. right. Like it's and like, hey, would you, would you like some extra colors to draw that graph? <laughs> Right. And it's yeah. like I said, like if, when you plant a seed, it doesn't always want to grow. Right. And, and sometimes the ground is not fertile and you have to maybe plant it in multiple places, but sometimes it just isn't going to grow. And now you have to ask yourself, what do we do in that situation? Right. Do we, bait? Do we start pushing too hard so the students start feeling like we're trying to guide them too strongly? One of the little tricks that I've done, if no one's drawing the graph and I really want the graph, I just grab a blank piece of whiteboard right. and I draw a graph. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. I put a red box around it. And then I put a number on it that nobody had. And then I, when we're doing the consolidation, I go, so can someone not in this group tell me what this group was thinking? And nobody has a clue that I drew that graph. <laughs> you, they were, because they were too busy at the boards. Yeah. Yeah, that's this is good because I I think I think uh, we also get questions like that. Uh, what do we do at the end of a lesson? Like, what happens if the students didn't get, get to what I thought? You know, they were going to get to. Like, you know, I planned these questions out and they and they didn't get here. Like, and I think we always said the same thing. It's like we step in and and we can say like, look, we're going to tie a bow on this. Like, we we want to walk out the door today with a learning goal going out with them. Going and the student knew exactly what the learning goal was that day and what they can do going forward. Like, we we got them thinking we, we 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 don't want them leaving going like i did some thinking today but i'm like how did it tie into like where we did two, two days ago or what we're going to do next like i did some stuff today but uh i don't know how it fit in with the grand scheme of things so we like to say tie a big bow on it and and so at the end of that lesson it's like we got to restate we have to restate and Kyle, we were chatting about this on the last podcast episode about the oblivious viewer effect. And, yeah. and uh, Peter, we were talking about it with you on that chat we had last week about it and uh, of, of this, like, uh, you know, when you're watching a show and uh, somebody, you know, it's a mystery show. And then it was subtly revealed what the, the big reveal was of this mystery. And you're sitting there going, Oh my gosh, like I got it. They made so much sense. Like, I can't believe that. And we, we had used the sixth sense as an example of like catching on catching on be like oh my gosh yeah in like, hindsight I it's all like, like so clear right it's it's so clear now and then where i was talking with a friend of mine who had seen that same movie or show and they're like i didn't i, I missed that part right it's like it's like some of our students are walking or out, the one who got it right away right right yeah. so some yeah. of us some of us are, are are getting us getting those those things in the movies and some of us aren't and that's also what's happening with us in our classroom if we were not making the connection to the learning goal they needed that day like what is it what is the the success criteria here we had to like make those connections manually in that connect stage so it's like we had to tie that bow on it so that they could they could they could walk out going okay i know exactly what i need to do going into tomorrow's class right. yeah yeah now, I, and I, I, oh, go ahead kyle sorry sorry i was going to just say isaac said don't forget a beautiful mind has a similar effect so yeah, uh, absolutely just, yeah just so you 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 think of that yeah, go yeah, ahead I, there peter i was gonna say um you know but so i want to just come back to this idea you plan with intentionality then you got to be able to zig when they zag so right you have all your contingency plans and sometimes you got to think of those on your feet and then, like as like you were saying, we got to tie a bow around it, but we also have to decide where we're going to tie the bow. True. Because yes, like if our goal was for them to get this far, sometimes they only get this far. If we tie the bow up here, yeah, that's yeah. not helping. We tie the bow here, we revisit the next day. Right. We, we we do some introspection, but the other thing happens too, which is this is how far I was expecting to get to, and they went this far. Right. And now it's like okay. We, I'll give you an example of that. I was observing a lesson by Jamie DePipo in Ottawa, Ottawa Catholic, and she was doing another three-act task with a candle burning. 
Mm -hmm. right? And now she had the same thing, the data around the room. And she was, she's an amazing storyteller, right? Like it's, it's performative. And she's talking about that. She's cooking a meal and for in-laws and last time the candles burnt out too soon and she needs to have. And, and then, so now the data is around the room and the kids start gathering this data and they get it into a table of values. And then this conversation starts. These were grade eights. There is no way this is linear. Hmm. This is the students. There's absolutely no way this is linear. And we're listening to this. Every group is saying this. This can't be linear. This is not linear. And then it's like, and we're just listening to have them, having them have this conversation. And then they draw the graph and they're like, huh, look at that. It's linear. And, and then it was like, okay, so, so they overshot what we thought they were going to go to. Right. And we're like, okay, so we need to have a conversation about this. What what made us think it wasn't linear? What does what does it mean to be linear? And what were you attending to? And now we're having to think about how they think and pull that out of them. And of course, the reason they thought it wasn't linear because every linear function they'd ever seen, the X values go up by regular intervals. And this was a candle burning. It was all over mm -hmm. the map. I love right? it. I love it. Yeah. And so it's like, I, I really like how you stated that, um, you know, going back to if you don't make it as far as you want to, oftentimes people want to like rush and get there. And then it's almost like all that work, all that hard work you did earlier is almost wasted because now there's confusion at the end, you know, so take what you've got. But then on the other end, if students are like pushing it further than you thought, it's like ride with that as well. You want to make sure that you really take it to that to that next place. Um, I'm looking at the time here, uh, uh, John and Peter, I see we've mm -hmm. got about seven minutes left. So I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to kind of tie a nice bow around on this idea. I'm hoping friends, as you're thinking about this conversation thus far this evening, let us know in the chat if you have any questions, any wonders uh, that you'd like uh, us to, to address here and ask with while Peter's with us. Um, one piece for me, I think that's really important as well, and I have it up on the screen at the bottom here. So we talked about tying that bow with consolidation, but also giving students the opportunity to do practice as well. Like we do need to give students the opportunity to engage in more than one problem, right, about an idea. So for example, if we go back to the stacking paper opportunity, we're stacking it on the table, students finally understand that, oh my gosh, this isn't a proportional relationship. This thing, like there's something else going on here. We do need to ensure that students do have an opportunity to play with another context, possibly another idea where they're engaging with this idea also so that they actually can build a little bit of that fluency and flexibility. And I, I know that's something that I really struggled with for a long time. Like I I had just like problem after problem after problem, but they were all kind of disconnected and all over the place. And, you know, students will still do great thinking and they'll walk away, you know, better thinkers, better problem solvers. But if, if at the end of the year, you're trying to say, oh my gosh, my students didn't do any better on this exam or test or whatever, um, we have to make sure though students also have the opportunity to kind of like reiterate some of these ideas that we're sharing with them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that as well, uh, Peter? Like what, what would you be recommending for educators on that piece? Because I think that's a, kind of a trickier one. It's not a, it's not a sexy idea or topic to, to chat about or to keynote on. Um, so I know it doesn't come up as often for us when we're presenting, and I'm sure it's the same for you as well. So I'm just well, curious. Ironically, I just I did a keynote of, about a month ago at the VC Association of Math Teachers Conference. I exactly no, it wasn't a keynote. It was a it was just a parallel talk. But there was a lot of people there. But it was um, it was on exactly this idea, like the the idea of students writing notes, which is a form of reflection, note making, not note taking. And then what we call check your understanding questions. And, and why are these so important? Because when students are in the thick of it, right? So we like to assume that the students are being logical and they're using deduction. They're making connections. They're seeing the big picture. They're seeing the minutia, that they see the logic of the whole thing. They see the arc of the problem from beginning to mm -hmm. end, that it's all buttoned up and neat and tidy. It's not because they've been engaged the entire time in that, in that activity in, in, through informal doing, right? 
they're they're spitballing. They're trying this. Let's try that. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's try that. Okay, let's do it. Let's draw the line. All right. And they haven't had a chance to connect all those pieces together and actually build that narrative, hmm. that narrative that goes, the narrative that we see so clearly, right? We see this narrative of how this problem unfolds. They they've been in the they've been in the thick of it. They don't see that narrative yet. That's what the consolidation is for, is to help them, is to find that narrative inside of their work. And it's important that it's inside of their work, because otherwise it's just like, do a bunch of thinking for 40 minutes and now ignore everything you did and just listen to me, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then we're not honoring their work. So it's, it's helping them find that thread, that arc within their work. Then they have to reflect on it. That's that meaningful notes. And then... It's what we call the check your understanding questions, which is now, can you can you actually do this on your own now? And right. that's not a meaning entirely on your own, but were you able to take something out of this? Have you encapsulated it, reified it, right? Have you turned it into a, <clears throat> into a construct, a schema that's inside your head now that you can that you can take with you out of the lesson, but then use in a different context? Right? What if it was, what if they were dictionaries? What if we started stacking them on top of the roof of the school? What if we, like, how does this change things? What if we used a chair instead of a table? Right? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? What if? And, and being able to flexibly think about these things. So that purposeful practice, although I don't use the word practice, but that purposeful check your understanding question, that opportunity to actually test run your new construct that you have walked out of the lesson with right and it's and it's so important and and if if i was to put a little button uh, you know a bow on this whole thing it's plan with purpose it's not going to go perfect yeah the intentional in the lesson zig and zag it's not going to go perfect try to close it off where you were hoping it was going to close off it may or may not it's not going to go perfect but we never learn from anything that goes perfect when it goes perfect, there is absolutely no learning to be had by us. It's, you know, the first time we did that task with the paper stacking, I had a 10. I didn't have a five. And then a group did the 10 thing. They just multiplied by five. And I'm like, huh, what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. And then I learn. Right. I need to have something that entices students that creates that cognitive dissonance so that it can put them together. So it's, I better throw a five in there as well. Right. If I'm going to entice them with a 10, I got to entice them with a five so that we can get some cognitive dissonance going. Right. The, the piece right. I really like about that as well, Peter, is, you know, I noticed in my shift in going from this, like, we'll call it pretty traditional, or at least the way I was taught form of teaching math to this way where I want students thinking the thing that you also get, whether you like it or not, is your thinking, right? And, <laughs> and to me, I like that. I, I, it really made me enjoy teaching again, whereas when you feel like you're reciting a lesson, where it's like everything is exactly, you know, as it should be or as it was planned, it, it's not that engaging for you as the educator as well. So this this really keeps you on your toes, but in a good way. You have to be open to it and just know that things aren't going to always go perfectly, especially the first time. Like you should not expect it to go well the first time, right? It, it's and going to be a lot of don't force learning. it. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. I've worked with teachers who will their plan to come to fruition. Right. And it's just painful. Like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's, it's a plan. It's yeah. not yeah. a script. It's a plan. And it's all plans are subject to change. Right. And I, I love that. And one of the biggest pieces is reflecting, right? I mean, without reflection, you aren't going to be able to get yourself, you know, to do it differently that, or, or better the next time, right? And the next lesson you plan, you'll learn something from another unrelated lesson. And with that, we're going to turn it to the group here. We have 924 people in the room right now. And uh, we want you, my friends, to do a little bit of reflecting yourself. Uh, we want you to share what is something that resonated with you here today. Maybe it's something that you want to try next week. Maybe it's something that you want to think about and try next month. Maybe it's something more big, more lofty that, you know, you feel like might take like the next 12 months, that next year to be working on. Whatever it is, uh, let us know in the chat. And uh, I'm going to nominate 
I'm going to nominate John. I was going to nominate Peter, but I want him to come back again. So I'm not going to give him this job. I'm going to nominate John to yes. have to randomly select someone from the chat, which is a hard job with like a couple hundred people uh, with almost a thousand. It is incredibly difficult. So we're going to give you a second to do that. And uh, while we do, I want to thank Peter again. Uh, friends, I hope that you feel that through this discussion, you are seeing how we be like how the beginnings of a task selection process or how a task creation process might look in order to ensure we get students focused on the things we want them, keep their attention directed at the piece of curiosity that we had sparked with them so they can enter that task. Uh, I'm hoping. All that right, you're folks. also feeling more confident in how you design your lessons for fueling sense making to make them think. And then finally, those intentional moves we've discussed in order to make math moments through the making of students and thinking in your math classroom. So there was a lot of key items here. John, mm -hmm. how are you feeling about selecting yeah, someone? I'm going to scroll here, just an just academy just membership scroll. too. Exactly. I think the thing's scrolling for you. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I, I'm I'm seeing so many big takeaways here, and I'm just going to uh, point to one. I'm just going to kind of flip my uh, flip my uh, mouse up and down here to uh, randomly kind of spin the dial, if you uh, if you will. Um, I'm going to point to. I'm going to say the name out loud, read what they wrote as their big takeaway, and uh, then we'll tell them how they can access this free year inside the Make Math Moments Academy, which can then also allow you to have access to all of these summit replays for the entire year, plus all of our courses. Uh, we've got about 12 courses on how to make math moments, plus all of our tasks and lessons and units you can access for your classroom. In today's episode, we were focusing in on the branches of our effective mathematics program, keeping in mind that the branches of your tree represent the development of educator pedagogical content knowledge. This includes effective teaching and equity-based teaching practices. If you're spending valuable professional learning time on too many things that don't make an impact, the tree's canopy will get heavy and begin to sag, hindering growth. And as you heard here, the work that Peter does through the thinking classroom and the three-part framework from Make Math Moments, they work so well together in order to draw out, draw in students, but then also draw out the pedagogical moves that we need to be doing in our math classes to ensure that students aren't just engaged, but that they actually make sense of the math that they're engaging with. So uh, here's your action plan. Um, what are you going to pull from this episode? What are you going to think about putting in place to support your branches and to you know create that strength? Uh, what pedagogical moves that you can make tomorrow? We're going to challenge you to pick one, two, uh, to try in the classroom if you have not yet done so already from Peter's work. And if you have not yet picked up Peter's book, book make sure you go and do that so that you can uh, learn all about his 14, uh, 14 elements of a thinking classroom and then how that jives with the Make Math Moments framework. I love it. I love it, John. Hey, friends, listen, if you're curious about the six parts of an effective mathematics program, uh, you might be in the classroom uh, where we call like the trenches, doing the hard work with students, or maybe you're at the district level. Hey, don't get me wrong. That's hard work to do as well. Trying to help your educators across maybe a bunch of schools or across a very far distance. Either way, you can head to makemathmoments.com forward slash report, and that'll give you an opportunity to take our 12 minute assessment, which is going to not only ask you some questions that might get you thinking and reflecting, maybe about some of the things that you haven't even thought about before, but it's also going to send you a customized report right to your email that will highlight your most urgent next step in order to make the biggest impact in your classroom. I don't know if you've been there before, but you know I was constantly making little changes in my classroom and putting a ton of effort into doing some of those things. And sometimes they came up flat. Sometimes I had worse results. And then sometimes it was a massive impact. Well, this report is designed to help you decide what should you do next? What area do you want to focus on next? And then in that report, we'll even give you some next steps that you can take and uh, some resources, some links, all kinds of goodies for you. So head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash report and you can take that 12 minute assessment, regardless of whether you're a classroom teacher 
or a district leader, you're gonna have the option to take the assessment that matches your role and uh, you'll get yourself that customized report. Hey folks, don't uh, don't forget, uh, if this is the first time you've listened uh, to our episodes here, hey, awesome, welcome. If not, uh, if this is a few, you've, you're a few in, you're a few deep, uh, then uh, no matter what, we'd love for you to hit subscribe and uh, and uh, give us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We put episodes out every single week, have been doing so. This is uh, this is episode 225, Kyle. So 225 episodes weekly. Um, if you have not yet subs- uh, if you have not yet left that uh, uh, rating and review, please do so. We uh, we read them and uh, it fills our hearts every time we read those. Awesome stuff. Friends, on our website, makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 225 is where you're going to find the links to resources, uh, including a link to Peter's book, uh, a link to some of his other useful resources as well, uh, the Make Math Moments framework, and complete transcripts from this particular episode. Once again, head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 225, and you'll be able to grab those. Thanks for listening to the Make Math Moments That Matter podcast, where we uh, we help you grow your mathematics program like a tree so you can impact. Thanks for listening to the Make Math Moments That Matter podcast, where we help you grow your mathematics program like a tree so your impact can reach far and wide. Well, until next time, my math moment maker friends, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high five for you.